Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. This time looking at a faulty SCSI 2 SD. I managed to kill it along with my 4000. I did an extensive burning test for a few days on my Amiga 4000 and uh, yeah, the Amiga 4000's RAM died and this was booting at that point but then after I fixed the RAM three or four days later came to connect this up and now this doesn't work. So I was kind of left with a dilemma of what on earth's happened to it? Anyway, if I just power it on, you saw the little flash there and then it queries the drive and then nothing, it just stays like that forever and a day. Uh, now I did speak to the uh, creator of this board, see if I could consider sending it back for repair. He was saying that when this happens, usually it's uh, when it sticks like that, it usually means there's something on the SCSI interface that's noisy. That isn't the case because I've connected the SCSI drives or the SCSI drives work. Um, and the same thing happens, I'll just power it off, the same thing happens, you just take the card out, this is a good test, remove the card, because then you, you're proving that it's got nothing to do with the card, because, yeah, look, that shouldn't even happen. What would normally happen if you've not got a card, you just get to see it'll fl flash, flash, flash while it's looking for the drives, because it thinks it's got drives, but the drives aren't there, if that makes sense. So, yeah, there is definitely a fault. Well, this is interesting, I've just made a discovery, I think. Um, I was measuring voltages and stuff on this. I'll just explain what I know about this. I've got two diodes here. The one on the left feeds the 5 volts, drops it by about 0.3 volt down to about 4.6, 4.7, and then the 4.7 goes to this tiny little IC here. And the output of that, I was measuring 3.1 volts, just under 3.1 volts, and it goes through this little inductor here, so you can measure it L201 there, either side of that. Um, and it was uh, less than 3.1 on the other side of it. Um, let me just see what it's measuring now. And I think that this might be the issue, actually. I think this might be the issue. Can you see that now? It's 2.1 volts, it's really low. What made it drop to less than 3 volts though? I sprayed a bit of freezer spray there, just for a second. Um, and now that's cold, we've got a lot less than 3 volts. We've got 2 volts. So. I think that this is the issue, it might be this little regulator here, it could be one of these little resistors or caps, they're super tiny, let me see if we can get you a little bit closer, maybe give you a close up on macro in a minute, but yeah, it's the regulation, I think this is why this is now not booting, actually, so uh, I'm just going to get some hot air on here and reflow this, just in case we've got a bad connection on that regulator, maybe, but I mean the, the voltage has dropped so much there, I'm inclined to think that maybe it's not a bad solder joint, but We've got nothing to lose, let's go and uh, heat that up, we'll get a bit of flux on it and heat it up. So I'm going with a relatively low airflow here. I've asked the creator of this um, the question there about whether it should be 3.3 volts, I'm guessing it should. And I'm guessing that that low voltage level is what the issue is with this. And this is why it's, it's not working. And the reason I've kind of not given up with this is this morning I powered it on and actually I saw a slight difference behaviour just for a minute and then it went off as if there was something temperature related around here. Anyway, I'll reflow that with some magnification and we'll go test it again. Well, you wouldn't believe it. I've definitely worked out what the issue is. Whether it's dead or not remains to be seen. Just watch this. I'll try and do this on camera so you can see I'm using a cable here instead. It's doing the same thing. You've got a diode, it drops the voltage, goes all the way to the regulator. So we've got 5 volts coming in from the USB and the regulator, let's just measure this here, and if I just press on it, see that look, 3.4 volts there, it was showing 3.3 a second ago, let let go, 3 volts again, press down a little bit, hang on, I'm not sure which side has got the bad connections here on it, one side has. Just get a little bit of IPA on here, clean this off, and wipe it down with cotton buds. So I'm going to attempt to replace these level shifters here. Before I do that, let me just show you what it's doing. And I think the issue actually is the Cypress chip in the middle. So it's powered on, queries the scuzzy, and then it just stays lit. Now the clue here, uh, I'll just earth myself before I do this. If I leave this powered for, I don't know, a few minutes, if I just feel the temperature gently here, these are all stone cold, 
and these ones should get lukewarm and I do mean lukewarm not like boiling um, the main process there you know freezing cold it's kind of like a USB uh, host isn't it but with uh, an MCU built in and it's obviously that that's doing the drive emulation there so there could be something wrong with that but there's a small chance it could be one of these especially if you don't take ESD handling seriously uh, and this area of the PCB here as I may have already explained it's super sensitive to temperature and such and that's the regulation so it can vary you know if you touch that and measure the voltage it can vary between like one and a half volts up to four volts and it should be outputting 3.1 volts um, and I noticed that a difference there, if that's in direct sunlight, I noticed a difference in voltage. And I think ultimately that's probably what killed it. Differences in voltage levels. So I forget exactly how these are used. It's something like a data bus, address bus, some control signals. I'm going to start with this one. I think there's more probability of maybe this being the issue, but it could be one of these here, you know, a signal not being passed or some incorrect value being passed back that way. It could be that if this side is failed, the side next to the Cypress, it could have killed an output um, or an input on the Cypress there. Well, more likely an output. If, you know, if this is trying to drive a signal high and then one of these starts outputting a low, uh, it's bye-bye one of these, you know, that's the thing. Uh, it could also be, because the voltage changes there that I talked about, maybe it lost the the firmware now I've updated the firmware on it so I know it's not the the updatable part of the firmware but maybe there's a bootloader or some core code on there that you can't easily um, re I don't know I don't really know what the upgrade process does actually when you upgrade the uh, firmware on these I'm guessing there's a separate bootloader anyway we'll heat this with hot air I'm about 415 degrees here shouldn't take long to remove this uh, the captain tape is just to hold some of those components down as well as isolate the uh, connector there. Quite a thick PCB though, I would imagine it's got well, its full layer. Sorry the camera powered itself off there, just as I was about to get that off. Ah, oh, the captain tape's moved. Oh, there we go. Hopefully no damage. So I've got a little bit of uh, flux on there. We'll just uh, try and clean those pads up with some braid. You can tell these have been uh, soldered on with paste in the past. It's got that awful appearance to it. That's why they look dark grey. Yeah, that's not too bad, and we'll get a new chip on. So I've got a big uh, tape of these here, plenty of them. So I soldered a couple of uh, points there. I uh, had to do it with magnification, I couldn't show you while I did it. We've obviously got lots of solder on the tip here, and I've got some flux on there, and we're just going to try and bob in and out here. We can remove the uh, excess, and there's going to be a lot of it, because the solder points are so blooming tiny. Look at that. Talk about bridges. The whole thing is one big bridge. Just get a little bit more. Solder paste is probably the best thing to fit something like this with. But I think if we use some braid there, we'll be alright. So we've got most of it off there. Can just reflow that with no solder on the tip and uh, a little bit of flux in a minute and then obviously inspect it with the uh, magnification let's uh, try that side oh my god Oh my god, I think I fixed it on the first go, the first chip. Now, I previously tried heating all these things before and had no success. Yes! Absolutely amazing! I can't believe it, it's working. So working straight from the SD card there, it's a bit jerky, but I think that's down to throughput. The SCSI card I'm testing with is a different one, which you'll see on another video. Uh, I'm just going to bump it up to 14 megahertz mode on the SCSI and see if that makes a difference.
So the IC we replaced there is an LVT125. It's kind of like half a 245, but with uh, low voltage uh, support there. You know, it's like probably a 3.3 volt device. So there's a question in my mind as to why is it being powered with 3.1 volts? Is that to uh, appease the Cypress chip? I'm not sure. That could also ultimately be part of the problem. So I cleaned up the whole thing with the IPA and cotton buds there. You can see it's uh, it's looking pristine. So it was that chip there, and it wasn't bad solder points. I thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly inspected it. I even went as far as just touching the pins a little bit to see if anyone would move, and they, you know they wouldn't. That was just before removing it, by the way. So um, yeah. Um, that chip had died. What would cause it? Well, I'm guessing a voltage change could. You know, instead of this getting the 3.1 volts approximately, it's getting on its VCC pin. When this board is freezing cold, it can be as low as 2 volts. So you could get some sort of uh, failure there from its, uh, I don't know, like a latch up type, a similar type of failure, I'm guessing. The other thing is it's near the edge of the board, ESD. You know, could be ESD handling. Um, although I think not, because it was working. Um, I'd booted it a number of times, but it had been on for about three, two or three days solid. So, you know, uh, and, and it had hot and cold cycles. So the hot and cold cycles, it could have been voltage level, you know, freezing cold in here at night, you know, uh, just over zero degrees, maybe three or four, two or three, four degrees at this time of year. But in the heat of the day, it was going up to, I don't know, 70 in here. It was like really hot. A significant difference in temperature at different points of the day. And it was running for two days. But at the end of that, it was booting. It was only after it was powered down, came to power it back on a few hours later, wouldn't work. And I'd not been near it. So it was a bit mysterious. The other thing is, uh, that although it was on for two days, the thing that might have ultimately killed this is the system it was connected to, it crashed, it failed. That's another video, it's a separate video. It was something I was aware of, a glitch that happened on an A4000 that had happened a few times in testing, but then ultimately it failed and it failed overnight. So it was sat there doing some activity on a, a SCSI drive. It failed at some point in the early hours, I think, and it was probably six or seven or eight hours late before I got to it. At that point, I powered it off and on, and it was still booting, but some damage could have occurred. You know, if you've got uh, this SCSI interface, say, driving uh, something here, you know, signals this way into this, when it shouldn't be doing and it's just stuck there and this is trying to respond with an outpour or something ultimately this is going to be the first in line that dies before this although you know it could ripple through and you could get some sort of failure on here as well but anyway so which of the three methods there was it ESD was it the failed thing this was connected to or was it this I don't know we'll never know what I do know is it's common uh, or fairly common for these to fail I've seen a few articles where people bought one of these and it's failed um, and the behavior is exactly what I saw where it responds to connectivity here you can flash the firmware everything looks normal but it doesn't work well these are your likely uh, best bet really so my other one that I got uh, while I was waiting for parts for this one came from Amiga Kit. I was convinced actually that I wouldn't be able to repair this otherwise I wouldn't have bought another one. Um, and you may think, well I'm crazy for buying another one, why would you, uh, you know, because this is the thing, this cost about £90 originally, I've had this uh, since about last September or October. It was a lot of money, I imported this from the States, had to pay tax on it and everything, it was crazy price because I couldn't find a UK seller. But I've invested that much time setting up the card here. I'm talking like days, you know, like maybe best part four or five days from start to finish, trying to get all these SCSI interfaces working with my different devices here and trying to petition the drives and copy everything across. And it's just been painful. So I was reluctant to, you know, start from scratch effectively with some other device because the newer versions work slightly differently, I think. With this one, this is nice. I can take this out, stick it into the PC, boot Win UAE, and inter you know interact with the first two petitions on there without an issue. It's a really nice, easy way to set it up, and I'll probably do that later to get the latest um, workbench on there. I've got like 3.1.4, you know, the version that goes with that those ROMs. So uh, I can upgrade that later. I'll show you the other one now. The other one's from Amiga Kit. It's got the Amiga Kit thing there, but it's, it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same revision board. So I've got the drive connected up again, let's power it on and see what happens. Lost track of where the LED is now, it's down here, look, look, look there you go. Straight away, working absolutely fine. So I'm very, very, very pleased with that, it has made my day. 
That does, of course, now need, mean that I need uh, two uh, mounts, you know, plastic mounts. I need the one to mount it with this, the A2091 here, and one for the GVP that it's booting from at the moment. And as you can see, it's booted again. Sweet. Uh, whilst it's doing its final file test there, you can see it's uh, flickering away there. Here's the other one. So you can see it is identical. Uh, so I've got the wrong way around there to compare it on. It's identical, obviously got the Amiga kit logo on there. And I'm glad that's on there because otherwise I would have mixed them up. Um, it's interesting now there's a position down here for a cap that was never fitted. And actually if you look at the other, there's another revision of the 5.1 here that only has one cap. It doesn't have all these cap positions here, it's got one cap somewhere along here and it's like a thousand microfarad. These are 330, so it's got like four 330s. So is this better than the one with the 1000? I don't know. And I think also I've seen one with two chips here instead of uh, one. So I am not honestly sure what the difference between those are. Uh, well, I do. They've got two chips instead of one. But what I mean is, uh, functionality-wise, as you go up the range, you know, the 5.1, it's limited. You'll get about a meg per second. As soon as you go up to, like, the 6, um, and there might be slightly later the revisions than the 6, you can get up to theoretical 2.5 meg. So you might not have the flexibility of being able to boot Win UAE on the... Um, you know, from the SD card, if you get a later version, from what I understand. But the functionality is generally the same, you just get better performance with the higher revs of the SCSI to SD. So after about three weeks of testing, I kid you not, uh, and been using this quite extensively, it's been rock solid. Not a single issue. So it was that little IC. Now, the voltage regulation down here, I can't help but wonder if this is what the issue was, because you saw earlier in this video, when I put a bit of freezer spray, the voltage went down to 2 volts, just over 2 volts. That should not be happening. If this area is cold, it shouldn't be dropping so rapidly. And I think what's going on here, there's a couple of really, really super small resistors. I think you can see they're so small you can't hardly even see them. One of those is in the realm of mega ohms. And that's the one that if you touch it, that you the voltage goes way, and you know, it can go anywhere just from you touching that. But also it's about temperature. The temp a little temperature change there, i.e. you put it in direct sunlight, your voltage goes up. Freezing cold, like in middle of winter, I would imagine it's going to be slightly lower. So, yeah, maybe I should revisit this at some point and maybe swap that out with some of the kind of regulator or remove these little resistors and get some uh, super high quality, uh, lo very low tolerance ones that maybe are not as subject to much uh, you know, tolerance change with temperature. It's probably the size of them, physical size of them, that is the issue. They're so small, they're going to be super sensitive to temperature changes. Anyway, I do hope you found the video interesting. If you do enjoy these videos, uh, please uh, consider subscribing. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you can, uh, or a thumbs down if you didn't like it. And if you would like to support the channel, uh, please see the Patreon links down below. Just $1 a month means I can continue doing these uh, videos without funding from Patreon and uh, you know donations from some of my patrons and subscribers and stuff. The channel wouldn't be able to keep going. So yeah, I'm very grateful for everybody that supports me. Uh, thank you very much for watching. I'll catch you in the next video.